Okay, we're recording, so I'll say good morning to you all once again, and nice to see you today. Hope you're all well. Uh, our target for today is to complete the reading from Thomas Hobbes. And before we jump back into the Leviathan, uh, I just want to uh, mention one or two housekeeping notes. Uh, firstly, I have now, uh, or as of yesterday rather, finished grading the essays that were submitted on Blackboard. Uh, it took me uh, 10 days, more or less, or nine days. That's to be expected. There are 80 students in this class, and although not all of you submitted your essays yet, um, some of you had better get them in soon. But now they're late, but I, I didn't penalize anybody yet, um, but I will now. Uh, it takes me a while to read them and to make comments to you. I can't comment as extensively as I would with a red pen on hard copy. But it, you know, it takes me a while to get through them. So about 10 days would be the norm for a class of this size. In any case, I hope you find my comments useful. Uh, some of them are very good indeed. Many of them were very good. And uh, some of you, I've made some comments and asked you to meet with me. And I'm scheduling those meetings, as you know, with email. So those of you who need to meet with me in my office, we'll schedule these appointments. And we'll meet in the virtual office, OK? So uh, today, I want to review very briefly what we covered last day in the plenary uh, with Thomas Hobbes. We made good progress. Uh, and today, I want to complete those extracts of the Leviathan that are most important for our purposes, uh, which are to identify exactly uh, Hobbes' theory of good and theory of justice. Well, we've already identified what he understands by the terms good and bad. I'll review that momentarily. And we're going to work toward escaping from the state of nature, right? His theory of human nature uh, tells us things about ourselves that maybe not everyone wants to hear, but uh, things which empirically seem to bear some weight and and lands us in, in a state. He's asking, what was it like for us you know, before there were governments, while we're in this kind of state of nature where we're living like an wild animals, it's the law of the jungle, right? Might is right. Um, and whatever happens, happens, and there's no judgment can be made about it because it's a state of nature. How do we get out of the state of nature? We saw a little, a little hint of that at the end of chapter 13. And in chapters 14 and 15 and onward, he's going to really spell out what we need to do uh, in order to institute a commonwealth. And that's what I'm going to go over with you today. Uh, before we get there, I'll be happy to take any questions about last day. Are there any things that you want to ask uh, about what we saw of Thomas Hobbes last day? Uh, if you have a question, please enter it in the chat room or, or ask it verbally. Yes, Ame. So I remember in your Monday plenary lecture, you said that Hobbes doesn't think people are sinful, but they're dangerous. Doesn't that kind of contradict each other? Um, no, I mean, it's a great question and really important to be clear about it. I'm glad you asked uh, that, that yeah, Hobbes says we're dangerous, but not sinful. Uh, let me put it in a different way. Are sharks dangerous, potentially? Yes. But are they sinful? No, they're animals. Right. And same will be said of all dangerous animals, right? Lions, tigers, venomous snakes, anything you can conceive of that might be dangerous to us or dangerous to other, you know, to other flesh and blood beings. Uh, they're dangerous but not sinful. So why aren't they sinful? Because they're animals, you say. In other words, they haven't made any laws, right? They're not capable of making laws. Right. Are capable of making moral judgments. So Hobbes is saying that if what what humans are like before we institute governments is that we're running around also like much like wild animals. We're not. We are capable, unlike them, of making laws and of defining moral codes. But prior to doing that, then we're going to behave according to our own whims, and and therefore we're going to be dangerous to each other for sure. But we're we're not going to be sinful. Because we don't yet have a conception of sin. Okay, okay. I get thank you. Sure, you're welcome. So this Hobbesian state of nature is really a state of nature. It's a state of what we're what we're really like more fundamentally as animals. We know that humans are partly 
obviously we, we come from the animal kingdom, but we also have, a, there's a big gulf that separates us from the other, on a good day, there's a big gulf. And one of the defining characteristics of that gulf is what? Our, our rational minds that we're able to do things that other animals can't do. We're able to develop moral codes. We're able to develop conceptions of right and wrong, conceptions of saintliness and sinfulness, uh, conceptions of what a government ought to be, and conceptions of laws, all those things uh, that, that animals don't do, we are capable of doing. But Hobbes is saying, what are we really like if we you, you take away from the human being the uh, you know the the whole apparatus of law and order and governance and what's gonna and what are we like if we you know before we evolve those structures Bob's just saying we're going to be a bunch of self-regarding dangerous predators basically uh, and and therefore not sinful just because we we haven't yet evolved uh, a conceptual framework and a, a legal framework and if you like a religious framework against which our actions can be judged. Uh, if we're just going to be um, left to our own devices, then we'll, we'll end up being much like all the other dangerous animals out there, uh, except that we'll be even more dangerous. Okay, so any other questions? All right, that, well, that was a good one because it covered a lot of ground. Uh, any, anything else about last day? I'm going to review anyway. Very quickly what we covered um, but um, all right if there are if there are no other burning questions then let's go back to Leviathan all right and just to review quickly what we saw last day and then we're going to continue uh, and ultimately get to Hobbes's theory of justice uh, today and then also we'll get to this other problem that I mentioned to you last day which is uh, how it is that we continue to have international conflicts and we never somehow are able or at least for very long able to have world peace there are always wars going on one way or another and it's been like that since history was recorded there have always been wars even though most people say they would you know like to have a peaceful world or a more peaceful world we never seem to have a peaceful world or a completely peaceful world and unfortunately Hobbes explains why Hobbes's theory of, of civil peace and how to restore um, peace in a civil society uh, within that is under the framework of one government, like one national entity or one nation state, as we today call them. And the price of that is going to end up being a recipe for international conflict. And you'll see why. So I was saying Hobbes didn't cause the problem, but his explanation of it is the real challenge for people who study uh, political science, particularly international affairs, diplomacy. Um, and, um, and foreign policy and so forth. So we'll have a look at that toward the end, okay? So meanwhile, let's let's just go back quickly to the beginning. Um, and remember, I, I'm, I'm asking you when you read Hobbes to uh, try to connect the dots. Hobbes is a very uh, systematic thinker. And so he proceeds from one step to the next step to the next step in a, quite a logical sequence, but you always have to be clear about what he's just said in order to grasp what he's about to say because he's building up an edifice of political philosophy and empirical psychology on this um, the scaffolding or this framework of deduction and he takes it a step at a time so let's just quickly backtrack i'm sharing the uh, extracts with you now uh, you all see this right and we're going back to uh, very early on. We started a chapter uh, six of Leviathan. And uh, okay, I guess that, that means I can't see you at the moment, but um, I'm going to just quickly. Uh, yes, you can all see. Fine. So I'm going to go back to the screen. Now, uh, remember his, his basic, basic thing we get from Hobbes right off the top is the question, his answer to the question of what is good and what is evil, right? And his question is very, the way he answers this is totally different from Plato and Aristotle. Uh, that what Hobbes calls good is whatever we like. So it's totally subjective. In other words, each one of us will say that things we like are good and things we don't like are bad or evil. So these uh, are, are, are ever used, he says, with the relation to the person that uses them. There'll be nothing simply and absolutely so. Right? 
So um, this will vary completely subjectively, and uh, no two people will have agreement necessarily on what they call good or what they call bad. They're just words. So there's no pure form of goodness, okay, such as Plato asserts, nor is there a, a sort of goodness of character that emerges as a product of uh, or a byproduct of practicing virtues, as Aristotle says. Good is just your own subjective inclination, it's just how you feel about something or how you judge something. And it's all about your emotions and all about your own perspective. So if you like something, you call it good. If you dislike something, you call it bad. Is this clear to you? So it's totally subjective. And I'm sure some of you could maybe find some agreement with that. I don't know if you agree with it. Maybe you don't want it to be true. But uh, unfortunately, it's pretty easy to see, right? And if you look at the world, uh, if you look at yourselves, I'm sure you'll grant that that's partly true. Because we don't, what Spinoza said with Hobbes' contemporary, he took it, a, you know, he, he said the same. Yeah, he does have a point, Erica. Um, you know, Spinoza, who agreed with Hobbes, said, look, we don't, we don't um, like what is good. He said, we, we call something good that we like. He took this right out of Hobbes, right? So if someone says, did you read any good books lately? You're going to recommend a book you liked. Uh, if you're going to say, did you see any good movies lately? You're going to recommend a movie you liked. So you're equating the two things. You're saying, well, I liked it, so I call it good, right? And if I recommend it to you as something that's good, I'm really recommending it to you not on the basis of any inherent goodness that it has, but on the basis that I liked it, right? Subjectively, I liked it, so I'm calling it good. So good and bad are labels. That's right, Ibrahim. It's really important that you get, you get a very firm handle on this to understand the rest of Hobbes. Uh, Ibrahim asked, so he does not believe there is an objective good outside us. Exactly. He does not believe that in the least. He is saying that these words, good and evil, are ever used with relation to the person that useth them. Hobbes is transparently clear, although the English is a few hundred years old. It's very clear English, right? He's saying that, that, that it's, if you don't like something, then for you it's no good. If somebody else likes the same thing for them, it's good. Completely subjective, as Erica says, completely subjective. There's no objective good outside us. Okay, is that clear? That's really important. Very important. I think you've all understood this now, yes? Good. I mean, good, because I like that you understood it. Okay. <laughs> when I say good. <laughs> all right. So let's carry on then. We'll go to the next page. This is very important, the basics, right? First things first. And so remember what he means by power. This is linked to good, right? By power, it means if you have power, it means that you have some means, some ability, some capacity to obtain something that you like, right? Some future good, right? In other words, it's going to be in my power uh, to eat lunch after this class is over. Why? Because um, I think it's good that I eat lunch. I'll be hungry. And it, fortunately for me, it's in my power because I have food in the fridge. So I'm saying I'm powerful enough to get, have lunch today, meaning I can get something that I think is good for myself. Okay. And that's what power means. It's your ability to get what you think is good. So if you can get what you think is good, then you're powerful. If you can't get what you think is good, then obviously you cannot avoid what you think is bad. Then you that's you know less powerful. Right. So your power has nothing to do with your money, wealth position, social standing, job title, etc. Your power is really just being able to get what you think is good. In other words, what you like. All right? Different conception of power, but an important one. So remember that he re specifically in chapter 11 repudiates both Plato and Aristotle. He says the felicity of this life, happiness in this life is not a, a satisfied mind. It, there is no such thing, he says, as finis ultimus, ultimate aim, uh, meaning what what Aristotle called, you know, the, the thing that we seek for itself and for no other purpose, namely happiness. He says there's no such thing as lasting happiness of the kind Aristotle proposed. That comes from an activity of the soul in accordance with virtue, nor is there a summum bonum. These are Latin terms. Great is good is the English translation such as Plato proposed, namely the pure form of good. It's the greatest thing, greatest virtue, because it illuminates all the others. It's the greatest good that exists. It's the pure form of goodness. And he's saying there's no such thing. As is spoken of in the books 
of the old moral philosophers. He'd studied them. He'd read them. He understood them. He's now rejecting specifically Plato and Aristotle. He's saying that it's our nature. This is where we have a more modern view, even though this book was published in 1651, which is you know, almost four centuries ago. Uh, but still, he's saying that what kind of creature are we? We're the sort of creature, he says, that has a perpetual and that restless desire of power after power that ceaseth only in death. Remember, our power is what we're able to get for ourselves that we think is good. And this is perpetual, he says. From birth to death, we are the sort of creature that wants things. We, we continually want something. Remember, your power is your ability to get what you like, right? to get what you think is good for yourself. We perpetually want things and restlessly want things. And whatever we want, we're going to want, whatever we get, we're going to want something else. Whatever we get, we will not be satisfied with for very long. We're always going to want something else. And this goes on and on at every stage of life. Babies want things, and children want things, and adults want things, um, and, and elderly people want things. At every stage of life, we all want something. And this really never ends. It only ends in death. Okay? So perpetual desire, power after power. Is that clear? We all perpetually are creatures who are in a state of want. Beyond our needs, we're in a state of want. That's the way we are, but we're not bad. This is just how we're made. Hobbes is not condemning anybody. He's making an observation that was not popular because people want to think of themselves as pure and good and noble. And Hobbes is saying, get real. You know, Take a look at yourself in the mirror. When you wake up in the morning, you probably have a list of things you want to do, right? And so you have this perpetual and restless desire. You have short-term, medium-term, long-term projects, all of them. Okay. So it's, it's, he's not judging us. He's observing us. He's saying this is what everybody does. This is how we are. It's universal. All of us are like this. All right. So back to the text. In consequence, we're really predisposed to ending up in conflict. So what happens in 13 is he gives us this view of human nature. And ultimately, he surprisingly, perhaps, or intuitively says we're more equal than unequal. And we're equal in one very important sense, that anybody can kill anybody if they really want to. The weakest can kill the strongest, either by secret machination or by confederacy with others. In other words, you can gang up on someone who's tougher. You know, if enough people get together, they can take anybody down. And that's his ultimate view. We usually think of equality as being a good thing. For Hobbes, it's a dangerous thing. It means anybody can kill anybody else. And also, he says, there's another kind of equality, and that's an equality of hope in getting what we want out of life. When people get up in the morning, each one of us has some reasonable hope in getting what we want from that day uh, or getting what we want in life in the longer run. And so this equality of hope will actually bring us into conflict. Because if only two of us want the same thing that we, if any two people want the same thing that they can't share, they're going to end up being either competitors or enemies, one of the two. And so we will end up in competition. It's absolutely inevitable. We cooperate, but we also end up more often than not in competition with each other. Constant power struggles, constant power struggles. Even when we're cooperating, there's a power struggle. So in our nature, again, this is the way we are made. It's not our fault. It's just how we are. We're the sort of creature that experiences three main causes of quarrel. And by quarrel, he means conflict and ultimately violent conflict. Competition, mistrust, if it is, remember, is mistrust. And glory, that's, that's a desire for respect or honor or reputation. Right? Okay. And uh, the, in the first place, uh, we'll, we'll end up uh, trying to grab something before someone else gets their hands on it because we're very competitive. In the second place, we'll come into conflict with others because we mistrust them. And in third place, this is the easiest cause of conflict, actually. If people look at us the wrong way, say the wrong thing, you use the wrong word with somebody, don't tell me you're not going to provoke them, okay? We're very highly provocable beings. These days, more than ever, you say the wrong word, you 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 give them a wrong facial expression, you express a different opinion, and you see all around us today eruptions of violence based on words and opinions. 
something different. Yes, I'm sorry to say, but it's true. And any other sign of undervalue, meaning disrespect, if you disrespect somebody by a word or a smile or a different opinion, you can end up provoking hatred or strong emotions and ultimately violence, right? If you disrespect somebody's kindred, friends, nation, profession, name, or indeed religion, missing from that list, but should be there. Any way in which you cast aspersion on somebody is likely to provoke violent response. That was true in his time, and it's very true in our time on a daily basis. So those are the three main causes of conflict. And he says, look, when we live without a common power, that's the importance of a strong central government. In his view, that's a common power. If we live without a common power to keep us all in awe, meaning uh, fear and respect, right? Fear and respect. Awe is a mixture of fear and respect. They are in that condition. We are in that condition called war. And whether we're talking about culture wars or gender wars or civil wars or international wars, it's all the same. They all have this common denominator of an absence of a common power to keep us in awe. When we don't have a common power to keep us in awe, we end up in conflict. And such a war, says Hobbes, is of every man against every man. Potentially, it's, a, it's, a, it's like all against all. Right? It's a total uh, uh, melee. It's not like even one side against another side. It's potentially everybody against everybody, even within groups that are supposedly allied with each other. They're still in conflict with each other, right? And you can look at that in the most straightforwardly literal political context today, that the people on the left are totally in different, they have all kinds of different conflicts within the Democratic Party. And the people on the right or on the more right side, the, the Republican, all kinds of different conflicts within that party. So it's not like we have a, a simple war between two different factions. Each one of those uh, parties to, to the larger conflict has within it many, many, many factions that are caught up exactly in the same power struggle. There's competition and diffidence and desire for glory among all of them, right? So you get ultimately this war of all against all. So a free for all, that's the expression I was looking for, Keith. Thank you, a free for all. Basically, we're, that's what it is a lot of the time, with the, you know, the strongest one emerging, but not necessarily immune to being brought down by a confederacy of weaker people, right? This is how it goes. So that's our nature. Again, he's not saying this is good or bad. He's just saying this is, you know, this is our nature. He's not making any judgment about it beyond this is the kind of creature we are. So it's not a good thing in the sense that if you like life and you want to have a decent life, and obviously this kind of natural condition that we're in, he's calling our natural condition, right? Beginning of this chapter of the natural condition of mankind. When we're living without a common power, then we're in the state, what's called a Hobbesian state of nature, right? I'll type that in a moment. So in such a condition, in our natural state, he says, we don't have any advantages of civilization. We don't have culture, really. We don't have, you know, navigation, building, and architecture. Uh, we don't have uh, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of other luxuries of living. No account of time, no arts, no letters, no society. And worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And in the countries where there's mostly free-for-all, in countries where really where things break down, if government breaks down, then immediately we resort, unfortunately, to this earlier stage where everyone's living in a fear and, and, and in danger of violent death, and our life becomes solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, which is too bad because we're capable of, obviously, much better things. But this is what happens in a state of nature. And he says to you, this thought experiment, if you disagree with his characterization, he's asking you, even in a contemporary context where uh, we have laws, we have a government, we have, you know, a justice system. Even so, he says, when you take a journey, you arm yourself and seek to go well accompanied. You travel armed and with others and with friends. You don't go out alone. And when going to sleep, you lock your doors. Well, most of us still do that at night. And even when in your house, you lock your chests. You, you hide stuff away. You have a safe or a hiding place or some place where you, you know, you keep your valuables locked away. 
And this, he says, you know there are laws in public officers, even in a, in a civil society, so-called. You know that there are laws in public officers armed to revenge all injuries. So what opinion do you have, says Hobbes? He's asking us this really brilliant question. I mean, it's rhetorical. What opinion do you have of your fellow subjects when you arm yourself? Well, you're saying they're dangerous, potentially, right? What opinion do you have of your fellow citizens when you lock your doors? You're saying, well, we can't trust everybody because some people will rob us, right? You're mistrustful. And what opinion do you have even of your children and people, let's say, you employ in your house when you lock your chest? You're, you're, you don't trust them, right? Do you not accuse mankind as much by your actions as he does by his words? And here's the key, the big takeaway, but neither of us accuse man's nature in it. He's not saying our nature is bad. The desires and passions and other passions of man are in themselves no sin. He's saying we are dangerous, but we're not sinful. That was that earlier question by Mame. We're dangerous, but we're not sinful. Why? Because we cannot make those judgments until we know a law. Until we make laws and agree on those laws, we cannot start deciding things like sinfulness. So in a state of nature, we're dangerous but not sinful. And this also, this phrase or this sentence, the desires and other passions of man are in themselves no sin. That was heresy. When this was published in 1651, that sentence itself, that line that Hobbes wrote, was good enough to bring the death sentence on him. Because in saying what he's just saying, he's rejecting the doctrine of St. Augustine doctrine of original sin which says we're born sinful that was the roman catholic doctrine of the day and the anglican doctrine of the day still that we're born sinful and we need to be saved but hobbes is saying that's not right he's, he's rejecting that theological teaching he's saying we're just dangerous animals but we're not sinful animals until we know what what the laws are and agree with, on what the laws are so sin for hobbes is not a religious thing it's a criminal thing he's secularizing it and that's all heresy. At Hobbes' time, it would have burned him at the stake, okay, for heresy if they caught him, which they didn't. So this is the point. And again, here's his, in Hobbes' words, so this war of every man against every man, there's no injustice, right? Nothing can be unjust. We can't just talk about right and wrong or justice is injustice. In a law of nat in the state of nature, the Hobbesian state of nature, there is no such thing as right or wrong, justice or injustice, just like in the jungle. We're talking about the law of the jungle. We're talking about might is right. We're not talking about right or wrong. It's not right or wrong for predators to hunt other animals and eat them. It's not right or wrong for sharks to, you know, take big bites out of their little prey. It's not right or wrong for snakes to envenomate uh, the things they want to eat. Um, it's not just or unjust. It's nature. It's just the way things are. Um, so where there is no common power, there's no law. Where there's no law, there's no injustice. So uh, you already get a hint. Hobbes' theory of, of justice will come from a law. There have to be laws. Until we have laws, we can't talk about justice or injustice. Okay. And so also in that same condition, this uh, state of nature, uh, where there's no common power, that there's no propriety. There's no, there's no property. There's no mine and thine. You know, whatever is yours is what you can get your hands on, and for so long as you can keep it. You know, and when someone takes away something that you have, then it's theirs. There's no, there's no. You can't say, well, that's mine, because there's no law. It's just whatever you can get your hands on is yours. Someone takes it away from you, well, it's theirs. It's the law of the jungle, right? It's the law of the jungle. There's nothing else. So, how do we get out of it? Well, interestingly, Hobbes says we can't reason our way out of it. Reason's not enough. We actually need to harness our capacity to reason to our passions. Remember, Plato and Aristotle are talking about the, if you like, the supremacy of our rational side as a way of convincing us to, in Plato's case, to apprehend the pure forms, or in Aristotle's case, to balance the soul and be rational in our in our activity of the soul. Hobbes is, is rejecting that too. He's saying, no, 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 no. We need to have strong emotions in order to get out of this. And we have to harness our capacity to reason to our actual emotions. And if we do that, we'll get out of the state of nature. And he'll show us how that's what we're going to look at next. But the way out is actually we want to have fear of death. That's a healthy thing. 
We don't want to die before our time. We'd like to live full measure of life. We'd like to have such things as are necessary to commodious living. In other words, we'd like to have food, shelter, and clothing, and education, and security, and you know maybe a few luxuries. But we certainly want to have such things, and we want to have a hope that by our industry, by our own hard work, in other words, that we'll be able to obtain these things. And if we have that, if we have fear of, of death and a desire of, of necessities of life and a hope to obtain them, then we're going to be able to get out of the state of nature. And conversely, if people don't fear death, they're going to be very dangerous. If people have, don't care about, about a commodious life, then they're going to be dangerous. If people have no hope, if people for one reason or another become hopeless, then they're going to be dangerous. That's why we need those things. And those are passions. Those are emotions. Fear, desire, hope. Those are emotions which actually can be used to lead us out of a state of nature. And so then by reason, we will suggest the articles of peace that we need. And that's what he comes on to next, okay? And he calls them laws of nature. But in this case, no state of nature, but the laws of nature that we need to obey to get out of the state of nature and into a commonwealth. And that's what we're looking at next. Okay, I've reviewed everything already, uh, but it's important to bear it all in mind to understand how we get, we get out of this. Is this all right? Is this clear? Any questions? All right? All right, you're all with it today. Okay, good. It's fine if you have questions, but if you're following this, that's important. In order to now we'll go on to really the new part, and this is the part that where he solves the problem, not every problem, but he solves the worst problem, namely how to get out of the state of nature. So now we're in chapter 14, which is the next chapter. And, and he's going to give us three laws, basically. He gives you a lot of laws in Leviathan. But we're going to look at the three most important ones. And, and that would be sufficient for us to understand uh, his theory of social contractarianism and his theory of justice. So here's how it goes. First of all, there's this thing called a right of nature. And in a state of nature, the right of nature is this right that we have in a state of nature to do whatever we see fit to preserve ourselves. We would today call this self-preservation. Yes? So it's a modern, you know, self-preservation is a modern term. But it, it really goes back to really Hobbes who was saying, we have liberty to use our own power in order to preserve ourselves, right? To preserve our lives, to do anything, he says, which in our own judgment and reason we can conceive to be the aptest means. So we have this natural right to do whatever we have to do to preserve our own lives and to do whatever we need to do in order to preserve our lives. So that that's the, called the right of nature. This isn't going to solve the problem, but it's always going to be there and nobody can take it away from you. You always have the right to self-preservation in Hobbes' system. Okay. Liberty is a different term, and then by, by liberty in Hobbes' day is actually a different meaning. You should note this well. The, the, the meaning of liberty has changed over the centuries. In Hobbes' time, what liberty actually meant was what the sovereign was not allowed to do to you. Your liberty was not to do what you want to do, and we understand today more of that sense of the word liberty, like I'm at liberty to do X, Y, or Z, right? I'm free. We, we often use freedom as a synonym, and it's not, strictly speaking. But we, we often use the word freedom as a synonym for liberty. So I'm at liberty to, I have the liberty to do X, Y, or Z. Usually to us means I'm free to do X, Y, or Z, right? But in Hobbes' day, they didn't mean that. The word liberty was what you were, what the sovereign was not allowed to do to you was your liberty, okay? <laughs> so this was the limits placed on the sovereign power and the absence of external impediments. Your liberty consisted of something that others were not allowed to do to you. And we still have one use of that today, still one remnant of that meaning, that earlier meaning. Has anyone heard the expression taking liberties with somebody? You, have you heard that expression? To take liberties you have, Mame. Okay, has anybody else heard that expression, taking, taking liberties with someone? And I mean, that's doing to someone something they don't want done to them, right? I think so. Okay, Ravel. Well, I'm just telling you that that is, the, that is the remnant, that is the vestige of this older meaning of liberty. If we say, don't take liberties with me, you say that to somebody, don't take liberties with me, it means I don't want you doing this to me. 
Okay? That's the older meaning of liberty. Your liberty is what someone's not allowed to do to you. Okay? Different meaning. Yeah? So taking liberties with somebody is like infringing basically uh, you know, what they don't want done to them. It's an older meaning. All right? Not the same as freedom. Okay. So we have this natural right. So here are the three laws that are going to get us out of the state of nature. I'm only going to refer to these three for now. That'll be sufficient for our purposes. So it's a precept or general rule of reason. And here's the first law that everyone ought to endeavor peace. We ought to try to achieve peace as far as we have hope of obtaining it. But if that's hopeless, then of course we'll need to go to war. Well, that doesn't sound much like a recipe for getting out of the state of nature, but it is important that we want in the first place that we have that disposition within us to be willing to try to live peaceably. That's very important. If we don't have that, we're not going to get very far. Okay? So we ought to have the peaceful disposition or endeavor, the willingness to endeavor peace means to try to be peaceful as far as we have hope of, of, of succeeding. If we can't, of course, we need to defend ourselves and protect ourselves. So that's the first law. We ought to endeavor peace. At least, at least try. At least try. Second law, more important, that man be willing when others are so too, as far forth as for peace and defense of himself, he shall think it necessary to lay down this right to all things and be contented with so much liberty against other men as he would allow other men against himself. That's that older use of liberty. So we should be willing, in contemporary English, I would say that, that we should be willing, says Hobbes, when others are too, okay, to lay down this right to all things. What's that right to all things? That's our natural right. Remember? Very important. Don't lose sight of this. A right of nature is, in a state of nature, you could do whatever you want. You have a right to whatever you can grab and whatever you can get your hands on. You have a right to do anything that you want to do, right, for your own advantage and your own preservation. That's your right of nature. And Hobbes says we have to lay down this right. We have to be willing to renounce our right to all things in order to live in peace with each other. If I think I can do whatever I want to you, you know, in order to satisfy myself, and that's not going to be a recipe for peace. That's a recipe for conflict. So we all have to be willing to do it. But notice, he says, when others are so too. When others are so too. Okay? To lay down this right to all things. In other words, if we agree that the best way for the economy to prosper is if we go into a store and buy stuff and pay for it, if we all do that, then presumably the economy will work. But if we shoplift or if we loot the store, the economy won't work. Right? Well, let me ask you a question. Suppose you go into a store to buy something, and suddenly you notice that everyone's looting the store. So you went in to buy something, and you were prepared to pay for it, okay? But suddenly you notice the store is being looted. So, I mean, are you gonna, are you gonna what are you gonna do? Are you gonna try and pay for stuff if the store is being looted? I mean, everyone's just grabbing everything and running out of the store. No, of course not. Because the, at that point, you recognize that law and order is broken down, right? So probably, you might. well, I'm not saying you would. Oh, you're still going to pay, but suppose the cashiers are looting too, okay? Suppose suppose everyone's looting the store, Keith. What are you going to do? Well, Hobbes would say you probably loot too because there's even nobody to pay at that point. And if, if people see you trying to pay, they may rob you because they see money, right? So force the yeah, I mean, you're going to have total chaos. We're going to be in a state of nature immediately, okay? That's why Hobbes is saying that you should be willing when others are too. So in other words, it has to be a collective bargain. It has to be this whole business of getting out of the state of nature means, or just leave, yeah, or just leave. That's what I would probably do. I would just say, I'm out of here. I don't want to be looting, and I don't want to be part of it. But if I can't pay for something, I'm not going to loot. I'm just going to leave, all right? When others are too, if 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 other people are willing to lay down their right to all things, then we should be willing to lay down our right to all things too. That's how it works. It's got to be a collective bargain that we strike, and that we are going to trust each other to a certain extent to abide by. That's the only way we can get out of the state of nature. So I'm beginning to see the recipe for this. Right? It has to be something we agree to mutually. Okay. And th this is really the key, all right? And so that, that is basically how it's going to work. And in order to lay down this right to all things, there's two ways we can do it. Right is laid aside. I'm just highlighting, right? 
important point, so you can read all of it. Right? There are two ways to lay aside our right to all things or renounce our rights to all things. You can simply renounce it and say, well, I'm just going to renounce my right to all things. So, um, Or you can transfer it. And there's a distinction. By simply renouncing, it means you, you mean you don't care specifically who the benefit it goes to, who the beneficiaries are. In other words, I renounce my right, let's say, I renounce my right to all things. And one way I do that is I renounce the right to rob my neighbors when they're not at home. Okay? And it's nobody specific is benefiting, but everybody in general, because I'm not prowling around the neighborhood looking for vacant homes to rob. So I renounce my right to do that. In the state of nature, I would have the right to do that. In a civil society, in a commonwealth, I don't. So I renounce the right to rob people when they're not at home and or burglarize them when they're not at home. And that goes generally to society. That's a benefit for everybody. If you transfer your right to all things, you're transferring it to a specific person or persons. So what happens when we elect judges? When we elect, when we when we appoint or when the state appoints law enforcement officers or when the state elects attorneys general or the state elects governors or the state elects people who have more power to us, we transfer our right onto them because they're going to act in our name and they have powers we don't have, right? We, we agree to give them powers that we don't have. For the most part, if we elect somebody in our system, we're giving them powers we don't have. We're giving them legislative powers or we're giving them badges and guns or we're giving them other kinds of powers uh, that we don't have. But we transfer power to them. It's, it's by collective agreement. They can stay in power only as long as we agree to transfer it to them. And if we don't like them, come election time, guess what? We transfer those powers to somebody else, right? That's the advantage of the ballot box. Here I'm saying, let's, let's say at least this much for democracy, rather than settling it by a, you know armed conflict, we say, well, if we don't like the job you did when we transfer power to you, we'll just transfer it to your competitor, right? We'll transfer it to your opponent. We'll transfer it to somebody else. But basically, we're doing it in a peaceable way. And so those are the two things. Our right to all things has to be renounced by us in a general sense, or indeed at times transferred. We transferred powers to others that we ourselves no longer wish to wield for the sake of a peaceful society. We relinquish those powers and, and give them to, to specific individuals. And that's where we get our political authorities and our other kinds of authorities, because we've given them power, correct? That's how it works. So this is basically um, partly by your word, all right? You have to give your word in order to enter into, into this kind of agreement. But Hobbes is very quick to point out that these words are not enough. Because he says, nothing is more easily broken than a man's word. Okay, so it's not enough for us to say, I promise to, you know, renounce my right to all things. And I promise to, you know, if we transfer power to you as a society, we promise to obey what you say, well, the law will be. Um, that's fine, but that's not enough because words can be broken. So there has to be some fear of evil consequence. In other words, there has to also be fear of breaking our word. Okay, there has to be fear of breaking the contract. It, not for everybody, but for some. There has to be some fear. Let me illustrate this very easily for you. What would happen um, if the police totally went on strike? What do you think would happen if the police vanished? I know some people want this to happen. I've seen it happen. I lived in a country where the police went I lived in a city where the police did go on strike. Chaos. Mame says chaos. Yeah, I, I've seen it. I've seen it happen, and I'm not saying, you know, that that all policemen are, or all, all enforcement officers are obeying the law themselves, and we know that some of them exceed their legal mandate and themselves commit crimes and need to be brought to justice. Absolutely. But what happens if they all go on strike? I saw it in Canada. Um, in a very, you know, Canada has a reputation for being law-abiding and peaceful, right? Or by and large, Canadians have a, you know, more reputation than than Americans for this. And I saw the police go on strike one day in a major Canadian metropolis. And within hours, literally within minutes, people were smashing and looting. And the whole main shopping street, this whole huge, like Fifth, a the Fifth Avenue equivalent of this city, everything was smashed and looted. And there were and there were crime was there were shootings going on and murders going on. And the 
everybody went on a complete rampage, uh, uh, to use Mamie's word, it was chaos. And why is that? Well, I didn't take part in the looting. You know, I, I watched it on TV. I said, well, yeah, I could go down and help myself, you know, shopping trip, right? No, I said, I'm not going to do it. Um, and, and, I, and I just watched it happen. So some of us will keep our word, even if there's no fear of breaking our word. In other words, even if the justice system disappears suddenly, many of us will still be law-abiding because we're self-governing, but many people will not. And so Hobbes says there has to be fear of evil consequences from the rupture. In other words, if you fail to renounce your right to all things and get whatever you can get your hands on and do whatever you want to do, if no one's looking, Hobbes says there has to be some fear of evil kinds. Otherwise, not everyone's going to abide by the law. Is that clear? So in other words, there are many, maybe a majority of people will be law-abiding. We don't know. Hopefully majority. But there are always going to be people who will be tempted to revert to the, he calls the fundamental right of nature. That is, you know, whatever you do, you're entitled to do. And if there's no fear of the consequences of that, then we're in trouble. There has to be. And that's one of the purposes of a justice system. You have to make some fear. Some people have to be made fearful of the consequences or else they're just going to do whatever they want. And that will end up being bad for the Commonwealth. So that's his point. Now, how do we actually do this? What are the nuts and bolts? Okay. If we mutually transfer our rights to all things, if I make a mutual transfer with you or with somebody else, that's a contract. That's where we, this is the beginning of what we call the social contract. Example, let's say, let's say I need a plumber. Let's say I got a plumbing problem. Okay. So I phone plumbers and I get a hold of a plumber and, and the plumber says, okay, I'll come by. Uh, I'll come by at nine o'clock tomorrow morning and this is my fee. And I say on the phone, okay, I agree. I'll see you at nine o'clock and, and I agree to your fee. So that's a contract. And those of you who are studying law, you know that even a verbal contract is still a legal contract, right? It's harder to prove in court, but it's still a contract. If I make an agreement with somebody on the phone, then we've mutually transferred right. Please understand in Hobbes' sense what's happened here. Because by making a contract with that plumber, in my example, I am agreeing that I'm not going to start phoning a bunch of other plumbers to find a cheaper one, right? And that plumber is also making a contract with me. Because that plumber is promising to show up at my house at 9 o'clock in the morning and not someone else's house. Someone else may offer him more money to show up. But if that plumber is honest, he has a contract with me to show up, right? And if I'm honest, I have a contract not to go looking around for a cheaper plumber. So we abide by that contract. And that's how society works. We're constantly making contracts with each other. And we have to be willing to abide by them or it's going to break down back into a state of nature. You get it? And that's the basis of what is called social contractarianism, right? This whole idea that what we're doing to get out of a state of nature and stay out of a state of nature is perpetually, basically, to be involved in social contracts. We're always making contracts with each other. So the word is, the, social, the term is social contractarianism. Right? That's a technical term, social contractarianism, because we're all in, embarked in social contracts. A marriage is a social contract, a lot more complicated. It may also be religious. But it's a social contract, a civil marriage is a social contract. You were asking about relationships last day. That's a contract, right? Um, a, a professional contract is a contract. A doctor's appointment is a contract. This course is a contract. I provided you with a syllabus saying this is what we're going to do and this is what I'm expecting you to do. This is what I'm going to teach. This is what we're going to cover. This is what you have to do to get a grade. That's a contract. Right? It's a contract. And we all have to trust each other in order for it to work because it can't always be fulfilled in the same moment. It's not like buying something where immediately if you buy something from somebody, you're fulfilling a contract right then and there. Like they're giving you the thing and you're giving them the money. So that's a contract that's quickly fulfilled. But what Hobbes is saying is that one of the contractors may deliver the thing contracted for in his part and leave others to perform his part some determined time after, right? And meantime, be trusted. And then the contract on his part is called pact or covenant. Hey, that's when you order from Amazon. I'm not plugging them. They got enough money, and Jeff Bezos is not hurting for cash. But, I mean, let's say you order something from Amazon. You pay for it first. You pay for it online, right? 
and then they deliver it to you. That's a contract because you're trusting them. They're not going to deliver it the same second. It take a day. They give you an estimation, right? The more you pay, the quicker it comes sometimes, right? So it's a social contract because you're trusting them. You're, you're doing your part by paying up front. But then you're trusting them to make good on their delivery of the thing that you've purchased. So sometimes you contract now and one of the parties has to perform later, as in a delivery, and they do. And as long as they do, then the social contract works. Okay, you getting this? You seeing how society from this perspective is viewed as a very complex network of social contracts of all kinds going on all the time. Is this clear? It's clear to you? Okay. So that's how we get out of the state of nature by engaging in these contracts with each other, uh, whether they're, you know, whether they're business contracts or professional contracts or personal contracts. You know, uh, you you agree to meet a friend for lunch. This is a con social contract. You're still making. They're trust. You're trusting. You know that person to show up, and they're trusting you to show up. So it has to be mutual. If we go around making false promises, the whole thing breaks down. So that's how we get out of a state of nature through this renunciation of, of natural right and transference of natural right. Okay. We, we, in other words, we give up something to get something. And really what these are called, another phrase is, and this is important, liberty limiting principles. And especially in the U.S., we need to be mindful. I think it's very important for us to be mindful of this. Liberty limiting principles. This is what Hobbes is really proposing. We cannot be at liberty to do whatever the heck we want. If everyone's at liberty to do whatever the heck we want, we're right back into a state of nature. And really by mutual transference or indeed renunciation of our natural right to all things, we're limiting our own liberties, right? We're saying, okay, there's certain things I'm not going to do to you when you're not looking or whatever. And uh, I'm going to you know, have to trust that though you will not do the same to me. We're going to li limit all our liberties for the sake of just another way of saying renounce our natural right to whatever we want. These are called liberty limiting principles. And we have to limit our liberties in order to be able to live together in peace. Otherwise, we're right back into a state of nature. Okay, So liberty limiting is not a bad thing. We don't want to have our rights. Talk, if you're talking about civil rights, you don't want them violated. Obviously, if you have rights, you don't want them infringed on. You don't want them abrogated. But rights and liberties are not the same. Okay, and that's important to understand the root of the distinction. Okay, so we don't want to limit our rights, but we certainly need to limit our liberties. We can't go around doing whatever we want all the time, and therefore we have to limit our liberties. Okay, and then we come finally to what will be his theory of justice. So we, we've worked toward this, and now we can state it. That what happens is that when you make a contract with somebody, like mutually transfer right, basically, and make a contract with somebody, then it happens that sometimes one of the contractors may deliver the thing at that time, such as money, and leave the other to perform his part at some time later. In other words, I'll pay you now, and you'll deliver you know, a new fridge to my home or whatever. Okay. In the meantime, be trusted. And then the contract is called a covenant where both parties may contract now to perform hereafter. You may, you know, promise to, to, you know, to both of you to do something with each other later to make a deal now that you're both going to uphold in the future. And then, then it's called a covenant promising to honor your contract to covenant. That's stronger. That's a promise to honor your part of the bargain. Okay. So first you agree on some kind of a contract, but then you promise to honor. Each promises to honor your part of the bargain. That's called a covenant. And that is the key term that we need. Because once we have a covenant, then we can talk about justice. Okay. So he really in realized in 1651 is doing a magnificent job of telling us what kind of covenants are valid, promises to perform our contracts, and what kind of covenants are not. And I think you'll find it, that's why he's early modern, because he's anticipating a lot of the things that we have in modern constitutions. Okay? For example, okay, um, it, a contract made in the state of nature is, a covenant made in the state of nature is void, okay? Obviously, because there's no common power. So, you know, there's no common power to enforce it. We cannot make covenants with brute beasts. 
In other words, with other animals, non-human animals, we can't make a covenant with animals because they don't understand us, right? We can't make a covenant with God either, he says. Because God can speak to us through his lieutenants or his revelations, but we don't know whether God's accepting the covenants we make. So God can make covenants with us, but we can't make covenants with God. He just mentions that in passing. Okay? Uh, the reality is that we have, this is the early now, early versions of rights, and you'll recognize some of this, some of you, in U.S. law. A covenant not to defend myself from force by force is always void. So you can never be forced not to defend yourself. Okay? You, you can never be forced to lay down your right to self-preservation. And we have all of our laws of self-defense. Um, so you can see they're anticipated in 1651 by Hobbes. That we have a right, in other words, to self-defense. Okay, You can never be forced to give up your right to self-defense. Nor, interestingly enough, can you be um, uh, ever forced to give up your... You can never be made to accuse yourself without the assurance of pardon. A covenant to accuse oneself, in other words, I promise to accuse myself, <laughs> but I'm not going to be pardoned, is invalid. Nobody can be forced to make a promise to accuse themselves without assurance of pardon. What do we call this in today's language, contemporary language? In other words, you're right, to put it in contemporary language, you're right not to accuse yourself, right? You're right not to accuse yourself in a court of law. What do we call that today? If someone refuses to accuse themselves in a court of law in the USA, do you know what do you know what they're using? Yes, exactly right, Keith. Good for you. Plead the fifth. Exactly, Timothy. Fifth Amendment. If you have a right not to accuse yourself. Well, here's the root. Thomas Hobbes is saying this. He's not saying it about America. America didn't exist in 1651. He's saying it about England. But he's saying no one, no one should ever be forced to accuse themselves. So I hope you see that this is a, a really in, important document. It's the foundation of modern political philosophy because it's very rich. It contains a lot of things. Same is also true, by the way. Same is also true of the accusation of those by condemnation. A man falls into misery as a father, a wife, or a benefactor. So your wife or your husband or your parents cannot testify against you either. Okay? And that is also true many courts of law. Okay? Accusations upon torture are not to be reputed as testimony. So you can never elicit you can never elicit an accusation by torturing somebody. That's amazingly marked for 1651. In the medieval times they had trials by ordeal. Torture was legitimate for many, many centuries in many cultures. You know in England, if you go back to medieval times, they had trials by ordeal. You were forced to walk around carrying hot coals in your hands. And if your hands healed up, you were innocent. If your hand didn't heal up, you were guilty. This is a trial by torture, basically. He says, that's no good. You can't torture anybody in order to elicit testimony from them. Completely not right. But then he says, the force of words being, and he's stressed this time and again, too weak to hold men to the performance of their covenants, because you can't trust everybody to keep their word. Yes? And so you need either a fear of consequence of breaking their word, or you need people to be proud and not needing to break it. And he says, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume the latter too often, but definitely we're going to need a fear of, of the consequences of breaking their word. In other words, breaking their contracts, breaking their covenants. People need to fear doing that because he says, for the most part, people are interested in the pursuit of wealth or power or pleasure. We've heard that again and again. It was true in Aristotle's day. It was true in Hobbes's day. It was true in our day. People mostly pursue either wealth or power or pleasure. And in order to do that, they'll often be willing to break their word. Yes, in our own experience, I'll bet you all know people, we all read about people in the news every day, who break their word or indeed break the law in order to pursue wealth, power, or pleasure. Right? Of course. So Hobbes says we need to have a fear. There has to be some power to keep everybody in awe, and one branch of that power will be making sure that they instill some fear. People will not break the law, because if there is no such fear instilled, many people will. Okay? So finally, we get to justice. And now you could, by connecting all the dots, see in chapter 15, I've just given you the main quote. And in this law of nature, it consists that this is the law about covenants, right? 
It says that the fountain and origin of justice, these are Hobbes's words, for where no covenant hath proceeded, there hath no right been transferred, and every man has a right to everything. So we're back in a state of nature. Without covenants, we're back in a state of nature. And consequently, no action can be unjust, as he said. But when a covenant is made, then to break it is unjust. So the definition of injustice is no other than the not performance of covenants. There's a few negatives in there. You have to parse. What he means is keeping your covenants is just and breaking your covenants is unjust. Okay? Breaking your covenant. So injustice is the breaking of a covenant and justice is the keeping of a covenant or the enforcing of a covenant. All right? And that's how we stay in a commonwealth. We have to have constant enforcement of covenants. So that is why we need to have a justice system. That's why what Hobbes is saying. And the saw, whoever the government is, be it a president or a prime minister, uh, you know, whoever, whoever, or, like, or a monarch, for that matter, that person has to maintain a justice system in order to, firstly, so that people know there's justice and a system can be then applied to in case of injustice. There's a remedy if there's injustice. And people who break their covenants can be brought to justice. And therefore, we have a possibility of maintaining a commonwealth. If you remove that, then you will also remove the fear of breaking covenants and we'll end up back in a state of nature with chaos and anarchy. Okay, is that clear? Everyone follow the connected the dots this morning? Good. Yes, yes, yes. I'm seeing good. I'm glad you're you're following this. This is very logical, all right? Remember, he started off by telling us some things about human nature that maybe we didn't want to believe, but he's ending up showing us how it's possible even though we're by nature very dangerous creatures, how by this mutual renunciation of our right to all things and by mutually being willing to transfer power onto others in order to maintain uh, a justice system, then we can indeed, for the most part, attempt to have a society in which we keep our covenants. And on the whole, that would be a just society. But if people break the covenant, whoever they are, no one's above the law. The notice the thing about Hobbes is that everybody is, in fact, part of a covenant. Someone has to be accountable. And even the people who make the laws are accountable. So that there, there, there has to be accountability in that system. And there has to be some trust in that system for it to work. Well, I'm glad that you we've gone a long way now from his early definition of good and, uh, and to his finally his definition of justice. But now you get the picture and you see how modern it is uh, compared to Aristotle and Plato. I'm not saying it's better or worse. I'm just saying it's many, many centuries later, 18 centuries later. So what we're seeing now is a much more modern view, both of human psychology and also of politics and law. All right. That's why he's so important for our modern day times. And the last thing that I want to discuss with you, and then I'll throw the floor open for questions and comments, is, as mentioned, this is all a recipe for civil peace. So you can imagine how, if this all gets established, that we're going to be able to have a commonwealth. We're going to get out of the state of nature and have a reasonable kind of civil society where people more or less have a chance to avoid violent death, where people more or less have uh, a possibility of a commodious life and have some hope to, uh, if not for them, at least for their children, of having a better life. And all these things will keep us willing, more or less, to renounce our right to all things and to enter into contracts with each other and to promise to keep them. That's the recipe for a commonwealth. And most countries that succeed in doing that are, in fact, very nice places to, on the whole, there's always some injustice. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. There's no utopia. But there are better and worse places to live. And for Hobbes, the better places will be the places where we have this kind of thing happening, a social contract, covenants, and a justice system. What's the problem? Well, he's established civil peace. But here's the problem. If you then ask Hobbes, what are the relations between and among all the different sovereigns of the different sovereign states? So you imagine, as we have today in the world, we have more than 200 sovereign states. Hobbes' day, there were far fewer because there were more empires. But still, there were sovereign states. And each sovereign state had a monarch. In Hobbes' day, 
It was monarchy or constitutional monarchy, the only the beginnings of it. Today, it's different kinds of governments. Uh, we have despots, we have tyrants, we have still monarchs, we, we have dictators, we have democracies of many kinds. But each of them, each, each nation state has a sovereign, right? Somebody in charge. And Hobbes says, so what, what about the relations between and among the sovereigns? Well, here's the, here's the problem. And this is in chapter 30. It's a long way. He's accomplished what he wants to already in the book. Toward the end of Leviathan, or the end of the main part, he says, concerning the offices of one sovereign to another, right? Like, what's the relationship? between the different heads of state, right? That's a fair question. And Hobbes says, it, it's, uh, you know, so in other words, what we call the law of nations or international law, right? Hobbes says, concerning the relations of well, one sovereign to another, I need not say anything because the law of nations and the law of nature is the same thing. This is the bad news, that all of these sovereigns are together in a state of nature. Why? Because they have no power to keep them all in awe. There's no common power that rules over all the sovereigns, right? Each sovereign's in charge of their own nation state. So when they get together, they're not paying homage or obeisance or allegiance to any major power over them. There is none. There's only the United Nations if they agree to things, but if they don't, then there's war. There's no way to compel everybody to agree. So these sovereigns are, by definition, in a metastate of nature. You get it? Sovereigns are in a metastate of nature. And each sovereign hath the same right, says Hobbes, in procuring the safety of his people than any particular man have in procuring the safety of his own body. So just as in a state of nature, we all have a natural right to do whatever we want with respect to our neighbors. In international law, Hobbes says, every sovereign has a natural right to do whatever they want with their own nation state. And, and unfortunately, that's why we have international war. Only if there were a common power to keep all sovereigns in awe could we have, in fact, international or global peace. And do you see uh, that the only way to have a, a kind of a global peace is by agreement, right? Like the sovereigns themselves have to enter into covenants, don't they? The sovereigns themselves have to renounce some of their natural right to make war on each other, yes? And enter into agreements. We call them peace treaties, for example, or arms limitation treaties, or mutual assistance treaties. We have all these treaties. But if somebody violates a treaty, what are you going to do about it? There's no global justice system. Oh, yeah, there's a court of justice in The Hague. You know, good luck. Pardon me. I mean, good luck getting justice, you know, in a global court. Good luck getting justice in any court sometimes. But uh, do you understand Hobbes's point? That's the main question. Do you understand that if you take a bunch of sovereigns and you throw them in a room together and ask them to get along, they're in a state of nature. There's no power to keep them all in all. And, and if one of them wants to attack another one, uh, just like in a state of nature, one person wants to attack another. If a sovereign of one country wants to attack another country, there's nothing to stop them unless they fear the consequences, unless there's an alliance of sovereigns that's strong enough that says, okay, if you attack you know, your neighbors, we're going to intervene. That might or might not deter them, right? But you, do you have any idea how many wars are going on in the world at any given moment? both civil or international. We've had fewer international conflicts in the last few decades, but we've had more civil more civil conflicts, interestingly enough, and sadly enough. Most of human history is a history of conflict. There have been at most times at least 30 or 40 wars going on. They're not reported because it's not in the interest of your sovereign or my sovereign or somebody else's sovereign to tell people what's going on in the world. And it may not be in the interest of Google either, so you don't find out if you Google it. But in truth, there have always been dozens of wars going on in any given time. And the reason for that is spelled out here by Hobbes. That sovereigns are, in fact, in a meta state of nature with each other. And they don't have a power to keep them all in awe. Do you notice that COVID-19 partly kept everybody in awe for a short while? Short while, right? I mean, er because this was a power, not a political power, but a you know, a pandemic power, and the pandemic power at some 
point early on did somehow make sovereigns want to cooperate with each other more in terms of sharing uh, medical research, in terms of developing a virus. There's quite a bit of international cooperation on that front. But it also got politicized, and it's become a source of conflict because of its politicization, both nationally and internationally. So, it, you know, although it was a common power to keep us all in awe, it wasn't a common political power. Um, let me give you a scenario from science fiction. If all of a sudden, let's say some aliens were going to invade the Earth. Let's say we picked up uh, a, a signal and we, we discovered there was some alien armada on its way to, to invade and conquer the Earth. Don't you think that we would all cooperate, at least temporarily? I would hope so, right? If some aliens uh, were coming to invade the Earth and conquer the Earth, probably you would get instantane. Suddenly, everybody who's always fighting with each other, they would start cooperating. We would join forces in order to repel what? But Hobbes says a common power. So a common power by threatening the whole earth is going to keep us all in awe. And then suppose we combine our military assets and our intelligence networks, and we combine our all our resources, and we drive off this alien power, and we succeed in defeating this power that was keeping us all in awe. What happens next? What happens once we defeat them? A business as usual, right? Hobbes is going to say. We go back to quarreling with each other again because there's no longer a power to keep us all in awe, right? So nations will start resuming their, you know, they'll start resuming the usual quarrels and we'll have all the usual problems. So it takes a power to keep us all in awe, which is a pretty drastic thing when we're speaking to the whole earth. I think the environment is a little bit like that now, right? Environmentalism is exerting that kind of force, right? If you think about that, global warming affects everybody, it's political, uh, but it's affecting everybody, so it's a power that keeps us all in awe. And so you're also getting more cooperation among, among scientists and environmentalists, but it's still very political. So not everyone's cooperating to the same extent. Okay, do you understand Hobbes's picture? So he's solving in his own way this, this terrible problem of civil war showing us how to emerge from a state of nature into a commonwealth. But the very solution to that problem will demand that there be sovereigns in charge who will then end up in a meta state of nature with each other. So we'll have civil peace, but always with the danger of international conflict. And there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, or maybe something that we haven't done yet, but someone's going to have to figure out a solution to that problem. No one yet has. Although Hobbes very, I think, very wisely pointed the finger directly at the source of that problem. I don't know of anyone who's really been able to solve it. Okay, any questions? That's that's enough of Hobbes. And um, if you want to read more, there's no shortage of material on him. It's very important. Uh, but I would like to, in the remaining time, know he has an interesting perspective. Yes, ma'am. I mean, it's very modern uh, and very, I think, very realistic perspective, not only on justice, but on human nature, too. Um, any any other any questions or observations? He's a very important philosopher, and obviously speaking to us today, much of what we see in the world uh, in terms of uh, civil conflict and international conflict can be interpreted through the lens of Hobbes's uh, political philosophy and also his psychology. Any other questions or comments? So you're all happy today? I mean, this has uh, been fairly quiet, but chiming in at the appropriate moments. Is the law of nature? No, 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 no. The state of nature, Timothy, the state of nature, there's three different terms, okay? There's the state of nature, which is this you know, problem when we're all like lawless, okay? Um, there's the natural right that is that we all have in a state of nature. Everybody has a natural right to do whatever they want to protect themselves. The laws of nature are the things that get us out of the state of nature. If we follow the laws of nature, we all ought to endeavor peace, right? As if we think we have a chance for peace, we should go for it. And that if everyone else is willing to renounce their right to all things, we should too, okay? And and that we have to make covenants with each other. Those are the those are the so-called laws of nature. They're all very clearly spelled out. The main ones are spelled out in chapter 14 you should go back and read, okay? So you have the right of nature, the state of nature, the right of nature, and the laws of nature. You need to be clear um, on those. I've tried to make them clear in just today's presentation, but you can go back to the reading 
and you can go back to Hobbes himself, okay? And it's just because he's using that word nature, right? Over and over. But the state of nature is what we need to escape to live in a commonwealth. The right of nature is what keeps us in a state of nature if we keep doing whatever the heck we want, right? And disregarding everybody else, protecting ourselves against everybody else. And the laws of nature are the things that will lead us out of the state of nature. Yeah, it's a bit confusing in terms of terminology, but conceptually, I think you get it, okay? Just be clear about his terminology. He uses his meanings very specifically. And if you read Leviathan, it'll all, you know, it's not changing. He's very consistent in his in his words. Anything else? Okay, you're all happy for today? All right. So we're um, accelerating the pace a little bit. Okay, you're very welcome, all of you. Now, look, we're accelerating the pace. Uh, so our fear and laws are what keeps us in line. Yes, exactly, Keith. It's the people's willingness to obey the law, and that's always a good thing when we ourselves don't need to be threatened to do it. If we're self-governing, then we can be trusted and we'll make contracts and you know, and covenants. We don't need law enforcement. We're not calling lawyers every two minutes. If someone violated the contract, right? Uh, if we're if we're trustworthy and others are trustworthy, that keeps us all in line for sure. But Hobbes says there still has to be more because people will always be out there who are willing to take advantage. And there always are. So we need beyond that some fear. There has to be some retribution. There has to be some punishment. There has to be some downside breaking the laws. Because if we don't have that, people will just break the law. So there has to be a justice system with teeth. What we say in English is that laws have to have teeth, meaning most people may be law-abiding, but always some people won't be. So we need teeth. I'm going to announce that, Raymond. The next paper will be due. It'll be a week or two after the five philosophers. Next week, we cover a very important, another philosopher. Next week, I'll just type this in. Next week, you have to read Kant, okay? Immanuel Kant, we're skipping now to a new theory, All right? Next week is Kant, um, and then a uh, week after, week after Kant is Mill. That's our last philosopher in this section, John Stuart Mill. And then your essay will be due probably uh, about 10 days, two weeks after Mill. I'll give you at least two weeks' notice, as I did for the previous one, okay? Don't worry about the due date. I'll make sure you have it at least two weeks in advance. You're very welcome. So uh, finish up with what you want to do with Hobbes. Make sure you understand him and delve into him more deeply, if you will. Also, next week, we're going to look at Immanuel Kant and his ethics, which are extremely important. And he's really responding to Hume. But we'll be looking at Hume on Monday briefly and see the problem Hume poses to us ethically. And then we're going to see Kant's response. All right, so that's on the menu for next week. Meanwhile, I'll, I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Stay well, stay safe, and uh, I'll look forward to seeing you all on, on, on Monday's plenary, okay? So take care now. I'm going to stop the recording. Have a good weekend. You're more than welcome, everybody. Thanks for your contributions today, and uh, I'm stopping the recording now.